So we covered all the material I need to cover, but the last lecture before the exam, I thought I would just emphasize I'm not going to cover. This was an add-on if I would have had extra time to talk about some software. Uh, this information, if you want to, you can go by yourself and download it. That's enough information to figure it out. Uh, but we want to solve some problems in preparation for the exam. Solve a problem. A uh, four kilogram metal part initially is 150 degrees C, so it's hot. It's cooled in a closed tank containing two kilograms of water, initially at a lower temperature, 20 degrees C. So I would do something like this. The initial state and then the final state, sort of sketch it out and say, I have a metal part that's hot and metal part that's not so hot at the end. Initially, I have a tank. Initially, the tank has this much water, but when you submerge the object, the water level rises. And so it still has the same amount of water. And so I start thinking about trying to introduce subscripts and notation. I'll use initial state one, final state two, that's common. And I'll talk about the object, uh, maybe I'll call this object A, and that remains A and B, and that remains B, where A is for the metal and B is for the water. I could have used M and W, but let's just use A for the metal part and B for the water. And we'll talk about uh, the initial temperature, T1, of A, the metal. Okay, I have a value for that. That's 150 degrees C, true? Then we could talk about uh, T1 of B. That's initial temperature of the water. I'm trying to organize the information given to me and make sense of it. And then I keep reading the problem statement. Heat transfers between the contents of the tank and the surrounding is negligible. But I think there's some heat transfer between the hot metal and the water when it put together, right? After the metal part and the water both uh, treated as incompressible with constant uh, specific heats. So let's put that down. We have the metal mass M sub A was given to be uh, 2 kilograms and the specific heat of A was given to be 0 0.505 kilograms, no, kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And just the space, I'll put it over here, the mass of the water was uh, 2 kilograms. Hold it, the mass of the metal was yeah, it was four kilograms, wasn't it? Thank you. And the specific heat of the water is 4.2 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. That, that information is given. Uh, calculate the temperature of the water bath and the metal part in degrees C when the thermal equilibrium has been achieved. So they're asking me to calculate T2 of the metal and T2 of the water after thermal equilibrium has been achieved. Do I really calculate two temperatures or do I calculate one temperature? There's really only one unknown, isn't there? It's just T2. I'll drop the subscript A and B. It's just the final temperature. And that's the same temperature when it's in thermal equilibrium between the metal part and the water. Well, this is where after you read the problem three times and you've organized with information that's given, and you have a clear idea, I'm asked to solve for T2, and I want it in degree C, the preferred units of my answer. That's when the student stops. Deer in headlights, if you understand that expression, and don't know what to do next. What do I do next? I know what I want to do. I know all the information given. How am I going to proceed? What do I do? Yes, I've seen that during exams. I got a formula sheet. It's over this page, over that page, over this page, and they're just flipping through formula sheets for 15 minutes during the exam. Well, give me a better answer than that. Some, there you go. No. <laughs> Do not check with your neighbor. 
<laughs> Somebody else. I'm sorry? Um, well, uh, think broader. Uh, sometimes I really get excited because I'll ask a question. I know the answer, and then students finally figure out, oh, he's happy with this answer half the time. I'll just give it to him randomly. Separate and integrate? It's like, uh, good try. Next time I ask a question like that, uh, Lahol Patal's rule? Good try. Next time I ask a question like that, you know, integrate by parts? Good try, but we're not in the math class right now. We're in thermodynamics. Big hint. I'm looking broadly. First, look, give that man a prize. First, look, look at the smile on your instructor's face. They know how to proceed. They're going to apply the first law of thermodynamics, which is a statement of the conservation of energy, and energy can be transferred by heat. I like that other answer. Hey, we're going to look at some heat transfer. Hey, and then it could change in the internal energy. Hey, I like your answer. There's something about changing internal energy. But the broadest perspective is let's apply the first law of thermodynamics, and to do a good job of applying the first law of thermodynamics, what do you have to struggle with? Another buzzword that I'm looking for, raise your hand and I'll take your answer. What do you need to really struggle with? To be very clear about. Good, you're going to eventually have to get there, but it's later in the game, a little further down, I'm looking for Something other than units. What do you need to struggle? I'm going to apply the first law. Congratulations. Let's go do it. Let's go apply the first law of thermodynamics. The system. Back to chapter one. Professor Creamy. Hopefully you have a class or two with him. It's the system. So many students, he'll tell you, get it again. They want to talk about well, I know how to solve this problem. I don't know why I made such a lousy score on the exam. Well, let's take a look at what you did. Where did you define the system? Huh? No, 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 no. We have to very clearly and precisely define the system. The system could be the metal part only. The system could be the water only. What do you think the preferred system is for this problem? The combination of the metal part and the water. So if you say, I want to draw a little dashed line around to clearly define my system, there it is at the initial state. Here it is at the final state. Makes more sense for the system to define with that dashed line around the final state where the water and the metal part are in equilibrium. But this is a big deal. System is the metal and the water together. First law, system, write it down, write it down. Now maybe the students, you know, the first, you know, flipping through the equation sheet. I need an equation, I need an equation. Now you know what you're going to get, write it down. How about uh, Q is e minus W is equal to U2 minus U1 plus the change in kinetic plus the change in potential. How many students when I get to thermo 2? easy first day. Hey, let's just write down the first law of thermodynamics. They can't do it. Uh, professor, I need my equation sheet and I'll start guessing which one of them is. Come on now, we got this one down, don't we? True? Yeah, we got it down. Why is this zero and why is it zero? You assume it or you look at statements where they may say it in the problem statement. Uh, do I see it where it's clearly said neglect changes in kinetic potential energy? I don't see anything in there, but did the elevation greatly change? Do I have now a swirling tank of, you know, with bulk kinetic energy going down the highway at 30 miles an hour or something? No, I don't have any of that. I have nothing of that. Now, well, this is now where we use a little more engineering insight. What about W for the process? It's zero. Why is it zero? There's no boundary work, no shaft work, no electric power work or anything like that. Why is Q equal to zero? Because there's no heat transfer from our clearly defined system 
and the surroundings. Now within the system, there is definitely a lot of heat transfer. The metal part cools down, the water heats up. But we put the system to be both of those parts, not one or the other. So it says right in here that there's no heat transfer with the surroundings. It's negligible. True? This sure doesn't look like much of a first law, does it? And then we say to ourselves, so we have the, the change in internal energy has to be equal to zero. You could say the U2 minus U1 for part A of that plus U2 minus U1 of part B of that. True? Didn't I just re-express it? Look, my system's made up of two parts, the change in the internal energy of part A plus the change in internal energy of part B is the change in internal energy of the system. And that has to equal zero. True? They give us the information about the mass and specific heat. It's a solid chunk of metal. It's incompressible. My model for that is MC for material A times the final temperature minus the initial temperature of A. Isn't that the change in internal energy for A? That's true. How about for the water? Well, they gave us the specific heat of the water and the mass of the water used the same. We're going to assume it's not changing phase. It's just going to warm up a little bit. Maybe it went from 20 to 30. Maybe it went from 20 to... Now, if it goes from 20 to 170, I've got to think about it. Uh, probably atmospheric pressure. If the water's up 170, I got a little boiling that must have happened. Probably not, you know, going to use specific heat there. But if it's just the heating up of liquid water, yeah, good specific heat works. MC for the water times the final temperature minus the initial temperature of the water. Are you with me on that equation? Then it's just a little bit of algebra, and I solve for T2, it'll be MCT1 all for A, MCT1 all for B, divided by MC of A and MC of B. Did I do the algebra correct? I know I skipped a step or two, I've done it a few times. You'll take a few more steps, but if you can skip a step or two with confidence and not make an error on an exam, I encourage you to do it, right? As long as you don't make algebraic errors. Some people, you know, used to get counted off probably in high school. Anybody get counted off in high school by quickly getting the solution to the problem? The teacher says, you didn't show all your steps. Well, guess what? We're past high school. You can skip any step you want, you know? Just don't get it wrong because your tears will drop down your face because you'll be like zero partial credit when you want a lot of partial credit. All right, so there you go. So we substitute our values. We put our M's and C's. Can you see how the, the units are going to be just temperature only left? Yeah. And not to just save a little time, let me put, tell you what the final answer is. 45.2 degrees C, T2. Let's say you predicted something where the final temperature was greater than 150 degrees C. Oh, that's cool. Isn't that interesting? No, look for your error. How about if the final temperature is less than 20 degrees C? Oh, no, no it's, not, it's not reasonable. So don't turn your brain off during exams. Leave it on. Sometimes I've seen answers. It's like just incredible, like 452 degrees C. I think you got a decimal point wrong here. There you go. Now full credit. Got it? Any questions about this problem? Ready to move on? Does saturated water vapor at 25 degrees C behave as an ideal gas? Could we, without introducing a lot of air, treat water vapor at 25 degrees C, saturated water vapor at 25 degrees C as an ideal gas? Well, if it behaves the ideal gas, does it behave and des described by this equation? Isn't that the ideal gas equation? So we could think about, hey, we could use the ideal gas equation and predict the specific volume as RT over P, true or false. But you know what? We have a table, and we can go get 
V sub G at 25 degrees C. The specific volume of saturated water vapor at 25 degrees C. Which one's going to be more accurate? A or B? The table's more accurate. But you know what? If the ideal gas equation gets you the same answer, it's pretty accurate then in that case. So let's compare them. We go to the table, 25 degrees C. We find that it's 43.36 meters cubed per kilogram. One kilogram of water vapor occupies a whopping 43.36 meter cube space. True? Then we go and we say, okay, what's R? 8.314. And then we have the molar mass of water vapor, 18.02. The temperature, just put in 25, put in 25 plus 273.15 if you want all those digits. The, the 0.15 is either in or out, it doesn't matter. It's three digits or five digits. It's a little more accurate if you put five digits. Let's put five digits. And then the pressure, what pressure? It's saturated water vapor, so pick PSAT, the saturation pressure, which is how many kilopascal? It's 0.03169. Those are in bar, and then we shifted over two decimals for kilopascal. And then I didn't put all my units, but uh, you need to check your units, and it'll cancel with the kilopascal. And then you pick up that the it's uh, 43.41 meter cube per kilogram. See, professor, they're different. Well, you're thinking more like an engineer. Are they really different? No. This is less than 0.1% difference. Nope. Right? How many people, you know, check the miles per gallon on the vehicle they drive? I do. I, most engineers do, and you just do it all the time. Hey, look at that. I'm getting 22.3 miles to the gallon. But most of the time, you have to work hard to get that third digit. Really, really, really hard. Most people can't, you know, I don't, I think I'm over 20, but I'm not certain if I, maybe I'm over 10. I don't know how many miles per gallon I get. True? All right. So let's take a look at another way of comparing these. Remember this equation? What is that? That's my compressibility factor. It's an adjustment such that if I have V from the table, okay, it's equal to Z times V from the ideal gas equation, or Z times RT over P. You know, it's, it, you're trying to use the compressibility factor to get closer to the table value. So one way of uh, interpreting the compressibility factor is, is the most accurate value of the specific volume, think about getting it from the table, compared to using just the ideal gas equation. And so in that case, the compressibility factor is 0 0.999. Is that close to 1? Yeah, it's close to 1. So that's another way of looking at a difference, a percent difference, or looking at the compressibility factor. It's close to 1. Well, just like anybody, what do you think you're going to do with that number next? Push it up. Hey, if it's good at 25, is it good at 35? Is it good at 45, 50? When is it going to break? You know, when does it start to really deviate? So we say, how about 50? How about 200? How about 374? What's special about this number 374 degrees C for water? It is the CP, the critical point temperature. True? You think uh, water, saturated water vapor, 374 degrees C behaves as an ideal gas? It's described by... You know, V is equal to RT over P? Probably not. Somewhere in the region, it's going to be breaking down. So we check it at 50, all right? So at 50, you can say, well, what is the compressibility factor? The specific volume from the table divided by the specific volume predicted by the ideal gas equation, RT over P. And you find that it's 12.032 from the table, meters cubed per kilogram. You got the 8.314. You have the 50 plus 273 to get the temperature in Kelvin. You have the 18.02 for the molar mass of water. And then you have 
12.35 kilopascal for the saturation pressure. True? And then what we find that this number is around 1.009. Compressibility factor is really close to 1, even at 50 degrees C for saturated water vapor. And if you compare the two, you find it's a 0.9% difference. So it went from 0.1% to 0.9%. So it's becoming more and more different as the temperature goes up. Let's do it at, so that's at 50 degrees C. How about at 200 degrees C? You calculate Z, same strategy, 0.907. Not probably close to 1 now. You're... 10% off, and the difference is 9.3% difference. It's not an ideal gas at 200 degrees C. Push it to the limit, 374, Z is equal to 0.2334, and you find it's a whopping big percent error. Because this is R bar, and I need, this is R, so uh, you could put R bar divided by motor mass. Just using one of the very many forms of the ideal gas equation, uh, P, V is equal to N, R bar T, or uh, is equal to M, R bar divided by motor mass T, or P, uh, V is equal to R bar divided by motor mass T, or R T. There's, did I encourage you really struggle with all those forms of ideal gas equation? Yeah, and it's not easy. You'll struggle, struggle through this class and struggle through the next class too because there's many forms that are useful for the ideal gas equation. And what I'm using back and forth is that uh, the number of moles times the molar mass is the mass. True. And that R is the R bar divided by the molar mass. That's just kind of our definition. Okay. All right. Where did we get that molar mass of water? Right there out of the table A1. True? And guess what is the last column in that table? What is this Z at the critical point? That's what ZC is. What number did we just calculate? 0.233. What number is here? 0.233. Okay. So it's hopefully consistent. That's the, the compressibility factor at the critical point. And we just calculated it right here. How would you do it? You'd use this equation. I'd just modify, say, it's not 50 anymore. It's 374. And that's not the saturation pressure. This critical point saturation pressure is somewhere in my notes. Critical point saturation pressure is 1554. Is that true? No, that's at 200 degrees C. It is, oh, I didn't write it down, but it's like 22050, oh, oh, something like that. 22090. Oh, oh. Very good, thank you. And then you could uh, rerun this calculation. You'd get a Z of about 0.2334. That'd be the critical point compressibility factor, not close to 1. So let's put it on a plot. What do I have? What's on the x-axis? Specific volume, but they plotted it on what sort of scale? Log. And so if I said... What's the specific volume at uh, anywhere along here? What is it? Along that line? It's a constant value. The log base 10 is 1. And so anywhere along that line, V is equal to 10 meters cubed per kilogram. How about anywhere along this line? 10 to the 2, 100 meters cubed per kilogram. How about anywhere along this line? 10 to the 0. 1 meter cubed per kilogram, right? So why'd I plot it on a log scale? Because this is real data. It's not a cartoon. It's, it's plotted accurately. 
and you see that this tail kicks out so far out in specific volume, the only way to get it to look decent is to plot a log uh, uh, for the specific volume. So, so way over here, along this line, it's 0 0.01, isn't it? 10 to the minus 2. All right, what about this y-axis? What's on the y-axis? Temperature. What temperatures does it range from? Pretty cold to right up here is 374, 375, the critical point. And then it goes a little above 400 degrees C, very hot, right? And now what do you notice? It's very steep over here on this side coming up. That's a line of saturated liquid. And then we have a line from the critical point, saturated vapor all along this line, right? And so put in some bars, isobars, uh, lines of constant pressure. This is a line of constant pressure of what pressure? Two kilopascal. Is that absolute or gauge pressure? Absolute. Very rare now we talk gauge pressure. All the pressures in the tables are absolute, etc. And so uh, what is this one? 10 kilopascal. These are all in a state of vacuum. They're under atmospheric pressure. If I put in 100 kilopascal, it's a little thicker line, isn't it? Why is it a little thicker? It's kind of close to atmospheric pressure, 100 kilopascal. And then now I have higher than atmospheric pressure, a lot higher than atmospheric pressure, okay? So that explains a lot of this diagram, but now what we will have is, is we have these red lines right here, and that's 0.1%. And then this is 0.2%. So what we're plotting is the difference between the specific volume, the tabulated value, and the predicted using the ideal gas equation as if only I only know PV is equal to RT. And then divide by the tabulated value and then express that as a percent. Use the absolute value on the error. Okay, I'm not interested in negative errors, just the absolute value. Does this make sense as what's being plotted? So, so I have a line here. It's as if I said a 10 kilopascal and just pick uh, 100 degrees C. It comes out to about right there, right? 10 kilopascal pressure, 100 degrees C. It's definitely not saturated vapor. It's superheated vapor. I calculate this, and I predict that it's around a 0.1% error. That's a pretty small error, isn't it? Then if I said, okay, 100 kilopascal at this value, you know, maybe it's 0.2%, 25% or 0.5%, and then 1% error. True? Then you just do this, and then you find that all these points in here have the same error. And then all these points along this line have the same error. So every, if I said, what about a point out here? I didn't plot the red line that went through there, but it's less than 0.1% error, isn't it? It's going to be really good. Out here, it behaves as an ideal gas. All over here. It behaves very accurately as an ideal gas. And then as you get into this region, well, into this region, well, you know, what's your tolerance as an engineer? Is it 1% error or half a percent error? And then you start getting 5% error, you probably don't want to treat it as an ideal gas. It's too close to the dome, to the critical point part of the dome, the top part. And 10%, we just stop plotting. That's the last line to plot. Okay? So what you find is that water vapor, this is one of those big conclusions, can behave as an ideal gas and be predicted as the specific volume using the ideal gas equation, even up to be saturated vapor, but low pressures, low pressures, far away from the dome. I did mention that earlier, but here I show you a plot of it, okay? All right. Any comments on that? Well, let's solve a problem. It'll take us a while to solve this problem. Please take good notes so that I can move away from this page as needed. A system consists of three kilograms of carbon dioxide gas. 
initially at a state one where P1 is one bar and T1 is 300 Kelvin. The system undergoes a power cycle, huh? We are tying in to what we did before, a power cycle, right? Uh, consisting of the following process, process one to two, two to three, three to one, where one to two is a constant volume to a final pressure P2 of five bar, and then expansion where PV to the N or PV to the 1.2 is constant, and then constant pressure process or compression from three back to one. Assuming the ideal gas model is applicable, uh, neglecting changes in kinetic potential energy, sketch the cycle on a PV diagram and calculate the thermal efficiency. So what's the PV diagram look like? Pressure, you want to do specific volume, total volume, it doesn't matter because it's a fixed amount of mass, three kilograms. I'm going to do is I'm going to pause, I'm going to walk around and see how many people can get that sketch of that PV diagram accurately. All right, so a few people started and they said, oh, PV diagram, I'm going to do this. But when you read the problem statement, you probably want to avoid doing that, don't you? What's, what's the key words in the problem statement to avoid putting a dome where you're going to have saturated liquid, saturated vapor, two phase, and at the top of it, the critical point. It's this wording right here. It's, it behaves as an, a gas. And what do you think type of gas it is? It's carbon dioxide. Uh, I doubt that it's very close to the critical point of carbon dioxide. Uh, so get rid of that, and we're out behaving as an ideal gas. Right here it says, this ideal gas model, <laughs> right? So push it away from the dome. Don't even show the dome. Oh, you want to show the dome? There it is. There's the dome, far away. Okay, now, you uh, basically can start tracing it. After you do a few of these, you get per better at it, don't you? Pretty good at it. Uh, so we have constant uh, volume, something like this. I don't know if it's out here. I don't know if it's going this way or that way or this way or that way, but it's constant volume process, one to two. And then from two to three, it's expansion. So I know it's going that way or that way or that way, you know, going two to three. And then constant pressure compression. Oh, constant pressure, that's that way, and it's compression. So I kind of put those all together and I get a cycle that looks a little bit like that, right? So what we'll do is go up, go back. State one, state two, state three, show the directions. Some people did a pretty good job of putting down here, they'll say, look, this is V1, you know, that's also V2. And this is, uh, here, V3, I'll put V over there. And this is P1, oh, you know what, that's also P3. And then up here, they put P2. All right. To help organize your results, you probably want to introduce a table, uh, probably like this. State, one, two, three. And put in the pressure in kilopascal or bar, whatever they put it in. Are they putting it in bar? Let's put it in bar then. And then the, the or did I put it in kilopascal? I like to work in kilopascal. So there you go. And then the volume, uh, no, not the volume, temperature next in Kelvin. And then uh, you could put volume if you like, uh, but I'm going to essentially need the internal energy. I know that. I'm doing uh, energy. Look at, I need the thermal efficiency. And another one, another table that I need is process. Process 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 1. And I'm going to be interested in the work. It can be on a specific basis or just total in kilojoules. And the heat transfer in kilojoules, something like that. I'm going to need that. So as I start working through this problem, I'll populate that table and fill it up. So let's read the problem statement again. P1 is 1 bar. That's 100 kilopascal. And T1 is 300 Kelvin. True. And at this point, 
Um, I'm going to leave U alone for a minute. Uh, I'm not going to put V in there just because I'm, I'm going to leave it alone too. But uh, what about P2? 500. And do I know any other pressures? Aha, 100 is P3, right? Yeah, then what, any other temperatures? Not really. I have to do some work. All right. How about the works uh, and the heat transfers? Do I see any of these where I can say, oh, for this process, I know what the work is? That's right. So 1 to 2 is 0. All right. Now, let's uh, figure out if I analyze the process 1 to 2, and I do the first law, I'm going to have the heat transfer in 1 to 2 minus the work. 1 to 2 is equal to change in internal energy, U2 minus U1. True or false? And that change in internal energy, I can get, if I knew the mass, it would be U2 minus U1. True? If I knew the amount, it would be U2 bar minus U1 bar. True? What's that bar over the U's mean? It's per amount, per kilo, not gram, but kilo mole, kilo mole, right? Kilo mole. So if it's behaving as an ideal gas and it's carbon dioxide, I remember a table. I remember a table in the back of the book if I want very accurate results. Otherwise, they would say something like, use this value of C sub V, but they didn't. So if I want to, I can go back to the table A23, the back of the book, for selected gases. One of the selected gases is carbon dioxide. And for a whole bunch of temperatures, I can get U-bar. What are the units on U-bar? Kilojoules per kilomole. Is it kilomole Kelvin or kilomole without any Kelvin? What are the units of kilo U-bar? Just per kilomole, that's it. And so we could put in right there 6939, 6939 for U bar at state one because it's a function of temperature and it's 300 Kelvin. So this is zero, I've got Q1 to two. It's like I'm trying to get Q1 to two. Can I get N, the number of moles? They gave us the mass, so you have to just jump back and forth. The mass divided by the molar mass is the number of moles. Is that true? And so you can calculate that and store it in your calculator one time, and then you're just working with the number of moles, 0, 6, uh, 8, 9, let me get my, my uh, paper over here. Kilomole. Because the molar mass of carbon dioxide, I didn't write it down, the molar mass is 44.01 kilogram per kilomole. All right. So it's like, okay, I know N. I know U1, U bar 1. True. I need to get U bar 2. How do I get U bar 2? How do I get U bar 2 right here? It's an ideal gas model. Three things come into play when you say ideal gas model. P, V bar is equal to R bar T. That's true. U bar is a function of T only. H bar is a function of T only. So I need to get T2. That's what I need, right? Yes, sir. That's it. So we'll go back and we'll say the specific volume at 2 is equal to the specific volume at 1. You can put it on a mass basis, molar basis, either way. And so this specific volume at 2 is equal to R bar T2 divided by P2, the specific volume at 1, R bar T1 divided by P1. Did I do that math correctly? And we use this type of thing all the time. 
So we calculate that T2, the final temperature, is the initial temperature times the ratio of P2 over P1. The pressures we know, the temperature one we know, it comes in at 1500. So then we go to our table, 1500, and we find that the U bar is 58606. True? So I'm going to jump back and put 58606 for U bar at state 2. At this point, we can now calculate Q 1 to 2. Q 1 to 2 from this equation right here is going to come in at 3522 kilojoules of heat transferred in. To take that 3 kilograms of carbon dioxide and get it up at constant, um, constant volume to raise its pressure from 1 to 5 bar, that's temperature from 300 to 1500 Kelvin. All right, ready to press forward? Now, the process 2 to 3. I'm thinking I probably got in my tool bag the first law. Q 2 to 3 minus work 2 to 3 is equal to N U bar 3 minus U bar 2. So, okay, that's the first law for the process 2 to 3. I need something else you can tell because both Q and W are, are unknown. Either 1 is 0 or something. Well, I need another way of calculating it. You integrate the integral PDV for the work. So the work, 2 to 3, is equal to the integral P um, dV. If you want, you put in um, uh, dV bar and put the number of moles right there, N. N times dV bar gives you dV. Okay, uh, but this is a polytropic process uh, where that is described by this relationship equal to a constant. It's so what you find is that integral is equal to P V bar 3 minus P, this is 3, 2 V bar 2 divided by um, uh, 1 minus 1 1.2 times the N. I know I'm sticking, trying to, but the number of moles, right? which is equal to R bar times T3 minus T2 times N divided by 1 minus 1 1.2. Yes, sir? It's not. I'm just getting the work by the integral PDV. Then I'm going to go back to, to get Q2 to 3. So let me uh, encourage you I'm afraid of running out of time. When I calculate that work 2 to 3, it comes in at 1000.3, and it's positive. Does it make sense that it's positive? Yeah, it's expansion work. Yeah, it's pushing back that piston, pushing back the boundary. Then we go back to the first law, Q 2 to 3 is equal to the work 2 to 3 plus the number of moles times U3 minus U bar 2. I know U bar 2, but I don't know U bar 3. So it's like I'm checking, I'm saying, I got that, I got that, I got that. Oh, I wish I had U bar 3. Well, if I knew T3, I would know it. Okay, how do I get T3? Probably ideal gas relation, just like you got T2 using ideal gas relation. So what you do is you do this. Um, hmm. Uh, do, do, do something like this. Say, I, I have a, um, T3 is equal to T1 times V3 over V1. Where did that come from? Well, the, in this equation, we started with the specific volumes or the constant from 1 to 2. Here, start with the pressure is constant from 1 to 3. 
and then use the ideal gas equation, you get that relationship, right? Okay, uh, you could put a bar on that, no problem. Both of them, bars. What do I do next? Well, I need to get V3, or some relationship between V3 and V1. But V1 is equal to V2, isn't it? And so we kind of do a little algebra, and we say that we know that P to V2 to the 1.2 is equal to P3 V3 to the 1.2. And we get that P2 uh, divided by P3 is equal to V3 divided by V2 to the 1.2. Did I do that okay? Hence, this is equal to T1 times P2 divided by P3 to the 1 over 1.2. I'm really running out of room. I apologize. But you combine the information about the polytropic process plus that the pressure is constant from 3 to back to 1. So P3 is equal to P1. And you get that the, the, the temperature at 3 you calculate the temperature at 3 using those two equations, it comes in at 1147. Now that you know the temperature at 3, you come over here, 1147. I have to do interpolation to get U3, U bar 3. When we do the interpolation, you find that it's 41339. All right, now that I have U bar 3, then I can get Q 2 to 3. Q 2 to 3 comes in at negative 176.8. It's really hard to tell. Okay, well, why is it negative? Well, there was some cooling during the process. Okay, 3 to 1, that's constant pressure. We can get that work by the integral PDV constant pressure, negative 480. And then do the first law for 3 to 1. You have all the pieces of the puzzle. It comes in at negative 2825. Now that I have all the works and all the heats for each of those processes for the cycle, what should I do to check my work? Sum them. Isn't that the work of the cycle, work net? And when you calculate the work net, it comes in at 520.3. If I sum this column, that's Q net. What should Q net be? Equal to work net. And it's 520.3. It usually doesn't work out the four significant digits unless you're doing it on a computer, but in this case it did. So that's really good. Now, what about the thermal efficiency? Let me try and tuck it in right here. What about the thermal efficiency? Is that work net divided by Q in? And the work net is 520.3 kilojoules. And where is the Q in during the process? Is it in 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 1, or some combination? It's only coming in for the process 1 to 2. So it divide by 3522 kilojoules. And you find that the thermal efficiency comes in at a 14.8 percent. Not a very good cycle in that sense, but hey, it's 14.8 percent thermal efficiency. All right, thank you very much for your attention. I'll see you Wednesday morning.